right, everybody, welcome to Dome at Home. My name is Scott Young. I'll be your host for this evening. I am the Planetarium Astronomer at the Manitoba Museum, and we've got a fun show lined up for you tonight. We're going to be looking for spacecraft in the sky. Some of you might have seen just recently there was a big report out saying, oh, UFO reports are way up because more people are at home and they're looking at the sky and things like that. Well, we're not going to talk as much about UFOs, but we are going to talk about the source of some of those reports, which are spacecraft that humans have built that are up there in the sky orbiting the Earth. Everything from spy satellites to uh, weather satellites to uh, International Space Station and things like that. This is a good time to talk about this because this is the 50th anniversary of the very first space station 50 years ago. So we'll be talking a little bit about uh, the past and present of space stations, a little bit about the future. And of course, we'll show you what's up in the sky, what you can see this week in the skies above Manitoba. With me as always, Mike is there marshalling the chats. He's taking care of all the questions and uh, comments that are coming in through Zoom, through Facebook, and through YouTube. How are you doing today, Mike? Not too bad. Scott, yourself? You know, it's been a pretty good day. Um, I was up early today. I was. Uh, we did some some Mars stuff on CTV this morning on CTV Morning Live with. Uh, I was talking to Rochelle Legassi. That was a lot of fun. Talking about the latest updates on Mars and uh, you know some ups and downs there. We were getting pretty excited about the the Ingenuity helicopter, and um, that's been delayed a little bit. But we'll talk talk a little bit more about that. All right, let's dive right in and take a look at the sky as we see it this week. We're using our program Stellarium here, which is a, a great program to show you what's up in the sky. Facing towards the north, again, it sounds a little bit like a broken record, but the, the northern sky, it's always the same constellations, it's just roughly where they are. We still have the Big Dipper very, very high overhead almost through the zenith, the, the point straight overhead. It's, uh, it's upside down, and um, basically one of the ideas is that, you know, if all the water in that dipper would, would pour out onto the land in the springtime when it's upside down like that, and that's what gives us all the rain. Or in our case, uh, snow right now. Southern Manitoba still sitting under a number of centimeters of snow, although it's melting quickly. We've got some great icicles going from all the leaks in my eaves troughs, so... A little bit of beauty out there anyway. The Big Dipper uh, is useful to point towards the North Star. There's our North Star there, always due north. The fainter stars of the Little Dipper, quite a bit harder to see. The stars of the W shape of Cassiopeia, sort of on the other part of the sky. And this segment of the sky basically rotates around in a circle, going around the North Star, never quite setting below the horizon. The horizon line along here, you know, the sun, many of the stars, the moon, all those things will set below the horizon, but not these stars. As the night goes on, they'll basically just wheel around the North Star. So you'll get to know them fairly well as you do your stargazing. Heading over to the west, we've got uh, something bright coming up. The thin crescent moon is right in this space here. I, it shows as a as a big white marker for some reason until we zoom in, but it really is a very, very thin crescent. Let's just get in there nice and close and get a good view of what we've got here. Yesterday, of course, the crescent moon was first visible, which which um, started uh, Ramadan. And so um, now the, the moon's a little bit higher. It's got a little bit bigger of a crescent. It's quite a bit easier to see. And it's right over by the bright red star Aldebaran over here in Taurus the Bull. Over the next few nights, as we zoom out, the moon will be higher and higher in the sky each night. It's basically orbiting around the Earth, and so that moves it this way. And, oops, pulled out my headphones again. That basically gives us the, uh, the uh, next few days with the, the moon rising higher and higher and getting to more of a crescent. Up above the moon, we have the planet Mars. Still there, still hanging out, quite faint. Is really, um, this is really its swan song, but it's kind of cool to still be able to go outside if it, if it clears up and actually look at the planet Mars and see it with your own eyes 
while at the same time we're getting all these great pictures back from uh, from um, the Perseverance rover and things like that. It's it's pretty cool that we can actually just see that from our backyard. And if you've been watching, uh, Mars has moved from way down here near the Pleiades, the star cluster over here, and has been moving up here over the course of the last multiple weeks. So we're seeing that orbital motion again. In another couple of nights, the moon will actually be quite close to Mars. And so if we get clear skies, that'll be a nice, nice photo op. If we hop over to the southern part of the sky, and again, I'll zoom out a bit here. We have all of the spring constellations starting to take center stage. Leo the lion up here, the, uh, the backwards question mark of stars, sometimes called the sickle, which is pretty easy to spot. It's, it's not quite as easy as the Big Dipper, but almost. It, it really does just sort of jump out. The stars are nice and bright and close together. And then the body over here. We've also got uh, many fainter constellations that are still up there. Over here, Cancer the Crab. And then over on this side, Virgo the Maiden, more constellations of the Zodiac. Right now, no planets cruising through those particular Zodiac constellations, but eventually planets will show up in those ones because that's what the Zodiac is. That's the path that the planets will take as they go around the sun and as they appear to move through our sky. Moving over towards the east, we're still seeing more and more of our spring constellations coming up. A, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the constellation of Boates. Boates, the herdsman, is actually looking kind of like a, an ice cream cone with a blob of ice cream on top. The bright star Arcturus, one of the brightest stars in the Northern Hemisphere, really uh, a marker of spring, great thing to watch for. And we can remember how to, how to identify Arcturus by starting with our, our unmistakable Big Dipper, you got the, the bowl stars, but then you've got the curved handle. The handle has an arc, and you can follow the arc to Arcturus. Oops. And that gives us a, a handy way to remember that star. Arcturus is coming up in the east, and that'll rise higher as the night goes on. Just rising are, I think I talked about this last week, the bright star Vega is just coming up in the northeast. This is a summer star, and definitely something to watch for. In between Vega and Arcturus, there's a couple of faint constellations. We're gonna just zoom in a little bit here just to get a slightly better view, but this one here is kind of like, I mean, it's just, it looks like a curve here, but to me, it kind of looks like a smiley face with two eyes above it. When you look at it in the sky, that's what I think of it. This is a constellation called Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown, and it's just a nice little curved group of stars to, um, to look at. You can almost fit the whole thing in a pair of binoculars if you're using binoculars to look at the sky, which I always recommend. So that's definitely worth checking out. Right next to it is this sprawling group of not particularly bright stars, but they're they're bright enough to see once they get up high. And it kind of looks a little bit like, um, almost like Orion with a, without the belt, you know, sort of a uh, an hourglass shape here. These four stars actually make a, a pretty regular shape. It, it's called the keystone, but to me it looks like a waste paper basket, basically. This, this is the center part of the constellation of Hercules. And even if you don't know the constellations, I'm sure you've heard of Hercules. Hercules is one of the most famous heroes for, of mythology. He had the, the 12 labors. He had the multi-season TV show. If you're uh, as old as I am, you might remember uh, the Hercules cartoons. Uh, Mike, did you ever watch Hercules, the cartoon version? The Mighty Hercules? The Mighty Hercules. That's right. Yes, I might have watched that a little bit when I was a kid. Yeah, oh, I, 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 uh, I never really liked the, uh, the, the centaur guy or the, the or satyr. I don't know what, it, the, the guy with the goat legs. And he'd always repeat himself. But then the, hurt, uh, hurt. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There you go. And uh, Daedalus was the bad guy. He was some kind of evil wizard. But then all of the monsters, whatever they were, they would fight a Hydra or a lion or, you know, one of the many things that Hercules had to do was, was fight all these monsters. And every single monster would make the same sound effect. It would be, whee, whee, 
And it was ridiculous because you'd have this lion animated fighting and it would be making noises. So uh, anyway. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Ashley's pointed out that uh, the centaur is Newt. Yes, thank you, Newt. Uh, thank you, Ashley. You are ab Oh, and somebody remembers some of the theme song, Hercules. <laughs> oh, gosh. Wow. Okay. I was not expecting that kind of nostalgia to come in, but I appreciate it. It was a good show. I watched it when I got home from school and uh, I didn't realize how much of it was actually based on real mythology and how much of that mythology actually shows up in the sky. So for example, I mean, we've got Hercules here. This is, um, this is Hercules's chest. And then he's got a couple of legs here. And then he's got a couple of arms here. Although frankly, you could turn it the other way and maybe this is his middle and these ones are his legs. You could, you could do it pretty much any way you want. Um, Hercules, one of his um, mighty deeds was to fight the Nemean lion. The Nemean lion was a, a lion whose skin was basically invulnerable to every weapon. And so after he beat that, he made himself a Nemean lion shirt. And that lion is Leo the lion over here. So there we have uh, another bit of that mythology that pops up in the sky so hercules not just uh not just a tv show but an actual constellation now one of the things we'll we'll talk about this more as it gets closer to summer because of course the summer um sky is uh, is when hercules is is much higher but i mentioned using binoculars and um i like to point my binoculars at the keystone here along the right hand side about I don't know, a third of the way from this star to this star, right in about there, there's a tiny little fuzzy spot that you can see in binoculars. And it's called the Hercules cluster because of course um, it's in Hercules and it's a cluster of stars. And as we zoom in here, I think we can get a little bit of a view. I'll just make sure the uh, images are turned on. There we go. And as we zoom in here, we can actually see that this cluster is a round cluster of about a million stars all packed together. I'm actually just going to turn off the uh, artificial stars. And so this is the Hercules cluster. You can see it as a little fuzzy spot in binoculars. In a small telescope, you start to resolve the stars. And in a big telescope, this is one of the glorious views that you can get. So this is a cluster of a billion or a, a million stars all packed together in a ball. Now, it is unlikely that many of those stars have planets around them because the gravity of the other stars would tend to pull those planets away and, and make a big mess. But imagine if you lived on a planet that was in a globular star cluster. You wouldn't have one sun in the sky. You'd have a million suns in all directions. It would never be nighttime for you. You would never know that there were stars. You would only know about the the million suns or whatever that are surrounding you, you probably wouldn't even see the sky. You probably couldn't even go outside because it would just be too bright all the time. So it would be a really different existence to have that kind of view. I like to think about stuff like that when I'm looking at things through my telescope because knowing what you're looking at often makes it a lot more interesting to see, especially if it's just a faint fuzzy and um, you're straining to see it. It helps to turn it into a mental game as well as a, a visual game. All right. So we've had uh, some constellations. Um, we're still kind of stuck for planets. Mars is over there in the West. We're still kind of waiting for a better um, view of planets and they're starting to come, but very slowly. I'm just going to fast forward to just before dawn here. And as we start to get to the morning sky, see if we can get any of this in here in the right time. Around five in the morning, if you want to get up. Five in the morning, basically you're looking at the same sky that we will see in August or so in terms of uh, the early evening. So you're kind of getting a preview for summer if you do get up that early. Off in the southeast, we've got a couple of planets. There's Jupiter, the biggest planet. It's finally far enough away from the sun and high enough above the horizon to see. And way over here, quite a bit fainter, is the planet Saturn. 
They're still pretty close together uh, from their close approach last December where they were almost touching in the sky. Jupiter's closer to the sun, so it's moving this way faster. So it basically, it passed Saturn. Saturn's still moving this way, but it's a lot slower. So we don't see it move very much. Over the next few months, they'll be rising earlier and they'll be getting farther and farther apart and a little bit higher in the sky. So we'll have a chance to see those planets coming up into uh, the next few months. We'll also have a chance to see Mercury and Venus coming up next month, but uh, we'll talk more about that when we, when we get there. Okay. We have any uh, questions that came in, Mike, on uh, the constellations, the planets, or on, uh, you know, the various episodes of Hercules? Uh, what's your favorite I, I would. I was just about to say, uh, the, the chat has been uh, busy with uh, quite a bit of Hercules comments. I think John on Zoom has pretty much recited the entire theme song. That's nice. great. Um, and Kim on Facebook uh, has decided to say that uh, the, the uh, Hercules series aired from 1963 to 1966. So she thinks that uh, she is, uh, has, has dated us, essentially. Uh, I want to mm. point out that I watched Hercules in repeats. I'm not yes. that old, but I watched it live uh, as it originally aired. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, Michelle on Facebook, uh, and I've been trying to research this answer because I don't know if you know it. Uh, she was asking how much of the disk of Mars has shrunk since its maximum size back in the fall uh, to what I, I guess what it would be to now. Uh, she's oh, had okay. some great views and photos back then, but how bad would it be now if, if uh, they went out and did the same thing? Yeah, well, so back in October, Mars was sort of at its closest point to the Earth, uh, this orbit around, which happens every 26 months or so. And it was, um, so we measure things in the sky in, in degrees, but sometimes one degree is still too big. Like, for example, the, the size of the moon is about a half degree or um 30 minutes of arc we call it so 60 minutes of arc is a is one degree sometimes one arc minute is still too big and we have to go into arc seconds so 60 arc seconds is one um arc minute so really really small numbers here mars was about um 20 arc seconds across at its closest point which in a telescope when you magnify it you got a pretty decent view now it's down below four arc seconds. So it is five times smaller, or it is one fifth the size that it was back in October. I did take a look at it um, about a week ago with my telescope, the same camera and telescope that I used back in, back in October to get some pretty decent views. And I could barely tell that it wasn't just a dot. It was slightly bigger than a dot and one side was slightly shaded because um, as it goes around the sun, um, there's one side that isn't fully illum illuminated, but it was pretty hard to, uh, to see anything. I didn't see any surface details at all. So it's really, really small. And that's because it's on the far side of the sun from the orbit. You know, when it's, when it was here in October, it was like very close to us. And now it's way back over here and it's just gotten much smaller and much fainter. So wow, that, that but, was a very effective demonstration what you did with your hand there. Excellent. Yeah, I, th I, I finally realized that this is close and this is far. I was doing it relative to my head before and the, that doesn't work. Gotcha. Okay. And just, just for accuracy's sake, I just found uh, the exact detail. So yeah, you were pretty much uh, bang on with the, uh, the largest size. That was 22 arc seconds back on October 17th. Uh, and nowadays it's down to actually uh, just under five right now. So still about the same sort of uh, scale, but uh, just, just for accuracy's sake, I got, yeah. the, got the info right here. Excellent. Great. Yeah. So it's been, uh, it's been quite, uh, quite a change and that's why we've pretty much given up on, on looking at Mars right now. All right. While we're talking about Mars, um, of course we've all been watching Percy and, um, or Perseverance, the Rover. We watched an excitement as it dropped off Ingenuity, the helicopter. They did some tests, they revved it up. And then they realized, hey, you know, there's something in the software here that in, uh, in an odd case could cause us a problem. So let's stop for a minute. And so they actually took a look at the software and took a look at the, at the, uh, the whole system and decided that they were going to update the software. Now, the reason for this is that there's nobody there with a joystick flying this thing around. Mars is so far away that radio signals from Earth take eight or nine minutes to get there. 
So that is way too slow of a reaction time. If you see a picture saying, oh, I'm going to hit a rock, and then you turn the joystick, well, you've hit the rock by that point. So the, the ingenuity has to be a robot, has to be totally autonomous. And they found this software bit. So uh, that has been the, um, the last week or so. They're uploading that. They're planning to set a new date next week. So we'll be looking forward to that. It's kind of a neat stunt. I mean, really, flying a, a drone on another planet, it hasn't been done before. The air on Mars is really, really thin, um, as thin as or thinner than what it's like up in the top of the, of the mountains here on Earth. So that's actually kind of cool because every year there's a bunch of people that go mountain climbing and sometimes, you know, there's a storm that rolls in or whatever and they need to be rescued. And helicopters can only go up so high because the air gets too thin. So, I mean, it would be cool if we were able to learn more about, you know, thin air helicopters from this. But quite frankly, I think the main reason they're doing it is just to get those amazing drone shots so that the one robot can take a picture of the other robot and and uh, it's just going to be cool. So very much looking forward to that. And I guess we've kind of already segued. Just so you know, we're not getting any sound off of any of your videos that are coming up there, Scott. No. Oh. Uh, well, there wasn't sound on the on the Ingenuity one, but there should have been sound no, but there. I, I meant, sorry, I meant your, uh, the, like the title screen didn't have uh, music and neither did Cool Space Stuff. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay, well, thank you very much. We, uh, yeah, we had a glitch with that. Oh, well, we'll, uh, yeah. we'll see and if we can fix that very, around. Yeah. Very quickly, can we just take, um, our friend Melissa on Zoom had a, a quick question about, uh, about Mars and about uh, uh, Perseverance. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, they were asking, what is NASA doing with the physical samples from Mars? Will this be part of a longitud uh, longitudinal study? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, well, right now, the physical samples are being collected, documented, and then kept with Perseverance. And because Perseverance has no way to bring it back. So what they're doing is that a future mission will go and land near Perseverance, pick them up, and then come back to Earth with them. So for now, they're just storing them. And it's it's going to be, I mean... I think they can bring back something like 12 or 15 samples. It's not a large amount, and the rover really can't go all that far. So it, it, it's not really, even calling it a study is maybe too grandiose. It's, it's really picking up a couple of samples. And so, of course, we'd love to be able to get a true representative sample and go throughout the entire, um, the entire uh, area of Mars, but that's just beyond the capabilities right now. So really, it's going to be... It's like that first sample, you know, oh, here's some rocks from Mars. We can bring to bear all of the technology we have here on Earth in the, lab, in the labs. We can learn everything we can about them. And that'll maybe tell us what instruments to put on the next rover. And that rover will be able to do more detailed sort of follow-up science. So it's, it's a pretty um, long-term effort, really, to, to get this out. Now, of course... All that could be thrown off by some discovery if they find, you know, fossilized life or they find water on the surface or, you know, they find something like that. That'll totally change the, the plans. Um, and so could funding. We've 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 heard these plans before and sometimes they just get delayed. So I tend to th to not think too far in advance with with all this. So far, they're going to grab the samples. They're going to have them all safe and documented and then they'll they'll come back to earth at some point okay let's see um okay so from a cool space stuff point of view as i mentioned we're going to be talking about spacecraft in the sky and we're going to start off with the very very first space station 50 years ago this week the very first space station was getting ready for launch this is salyut one it was built by the, the soviet union in uh, in 1971, they had they had lost the moon race to the Americans. They had um, still not been able to even do a follow up and and get you know be second to the moon. And so they decided we're not even going to go to the moon at all now. We're not going to bother. We're going to do something totally different, and we're going to do something that maybe has more practical applications, or at least we can we can spin it that way. So they decided they would build a space station that would orbit around the Earth that people could live on for long periods of time. 
and they built Salute, which is um, quite a remarkable piece of technology, quite honestly. It's, uh, it's the green part here. And it's, so it's, it's basically made of three cylinders. There's one over here, the big one. And then there's a little sort of a cone that reduces down to this cylinder. Then there's another little cone that goes down to this cylinder. So it's sort of these three cylinders in a row, um, which is great for making models because you can use toilet paper rolls or whatever and, and make, uh, make these models. The white thing over here, this is the Soyuz spacecraft, which uh, 50 years ago had already been flying quite a bit and is still in fact flying today. So this is how the people would get up and down. And then they would dock with the space station. They would go inside. And here you can see there's a, there's a little astronaut. For some reason in zero gravity, he's sitting in a chair. I don't know quite how that works. And there's all sorts of experiments and cameras and things like that. So Salyut went up and um, the Russians back in the day were very secretive and they didn't have a very good sense of public relations. For example, they didn't send color film up there, which to me is mind boggling. This is one of the only pictures of Salyut 1 in space taken from one of the visiting crews. You can see the, the three cylinder sort of shape there. These little solar panels folded off the side here. This was, this was a program that got put together very, very quickly, kind of on a shoestring. Um, I think it's actually one of the unsung, most impressive uh, space deeds ever because it really did open the door for uh, a major part of human spaceflight. So I want you to watch this little um, shape here because you'll you'll see it coming up um, in some of the future things. So Salyut 1 went up, a couple of visiting crews, and then as planned, it re-entered in the atmosphere and burnt up. They tried launching Salyut 2, which um, is launched without anybody on it, and then people would go visit it, but the rocket didn't work. And then they launched Salyut 3, which was, was a secret military one that they didn't want to talk about, and there are no pictures of. And then the Americans launched their first space station called Skylab. This was basically an empty fuel tank from one of their leftover moon rockets that got cancelled and they strapped some scientific equipment and solar panels onto it and they launched it into space. And it was actually almost a disaster because as it went up into space, some of the solar panels fell off and uh, the first crew had to uh, install, uh, you can sort of see this, this tarp over here. There, it was getting too hot because some of the, the insulation came off. Anyway, it was, it was almost a, uh, a big mess, but the crew managed to save it. They had three, uh, very successful mission staying in space for up to almost three months. And then Skylab fell out of the sky and burned up and a bunch of pieces fell on Australia. And um, right around this point, people started thinking, you know, maybe we should have a better plan for these spaceships once they're done than just letting them fall onto people's heads. But not everybody learned that lesson. Um, Salyut 4, the Soviet Union launched this one. Again, there's that same kind of shape. It's, it's at an angle, but it, basically it's the same shape. And uh, it fell into the ocean as well. Salyut 6, there's the same shape. Now you're starting to see different solar panels. You're starting to see the, the different experiments. There's a big hole in the side here where a gigantic camera looks out that could look out into space but it could also look down onto the earth and photograph all sorts of things. Salyut 7. If, uh, if any of you speak Russian, there's a great movie in Russian called Salyut 7. Salyut 7 was like the Apollo 13 of the Soviet space program. You should definitely check it out because basically um, while there was, were no visiting crew members on it, the whole space station lost control and, and uh, the batteries failed and stuff like that. And this crew had to come in and basically force their way in and get everything going and there were spacewalks where it was it's 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 an awesome story so definitely check it out unfortunately it's not available with subtitles yet but uh, i have watched it and uh, even though i didn't hear or understand a single word it was a great watch so while salyut 7 was still up there the russians launched a new space station and they got away from the numbering system and they called it uh, they called it Mir, 
some of you will remember the Mir space station. This is like a Lego space station. They would send up one piece and then another rocket would send up another piece and they'd stick them together. And then another rocket would send up another one and then they'd stick them together. And, um, oh, I see a question here about the, the uh, solar panels. Um, these solar panels are all folded up for launch. And then once they, once they get there out into space, they can sort of unfold. And usually they sort of come out like a, like an accordion or something like that. And it, it lets them sort of spread out. And that's what gives the space station its power. Uh, oh, and Vivian's asking, uh, how much space do these stations have inside? One of these modules here is about the size of a school bus but not with as much room because there's a bunch of space taken up in there that, uh, you know, by equipment and air tanks and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not, it's not really comfortable. Um, the early ones, the, the early salutes, it was like spending 30 days in a minivan. So not great. Now, the great thing about Mir, it was modular. They added all these pieces to it. Um, and at this point, yeah, that's right. Uh, Ulrich just says Mir is the Russian word for peace. 1986, for those of you that may remember, that was sort of deep into the Cold War, but um, detente was coming, um, Gorbachev and Reagan and all that kind of, there was, there was this sort of um, thawing of the Cold War a little bit. And so the idea was, here's a Soviet space station, but let's see if we could do a uh, a joint mission and so the space shuttle the american space shuttle actually went and docked with the mir space station uh, a few times in fact astronaut chris hadfield canadian who many people will will know his first mission was actually sts 77 to the mir space station and there's this great picture of him at Can uh, canadian space agency headquarters um the uh basically it's it's him in this corner of the Mir space station and uh, he's smiling and everyone's taking pictures and laughing and stuff like that. And, and um, he found out later that basically they made him pose in the garbage dump, which is where they just kept all the toilet bags until they got uh, disposed of. So kind of funny. He, uh, he, he tells the story way better, but anyway, Mir turned into a pretty useful space station. It was up there for a long time. Um, and you know, it looks like they finally got different designs of their spacecraft and things like that. There's these, I mean, there's some similarities here. They're kind of cylindrical because you send them up in a rocket, but let's look at a different angle. Oh, oh no, there's the Salyut. Literally the Mir space station was Salyut 8, and then they just added pieces onto it. So here you have technology that's already been in use for 30 years, almost unchanged. And of course the Soyuz spacecraft that the that the Soviets were using at this point, also unchanged since uh, 1967, really. So, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, Mir deorbited in 2001. They actually made it crash into an empty part of the ocean. They, they realized it was too big to, you know, just let it fall out of the sky. And so, um, but by the time that Mir went down, the International Space Station was already starting to be built. And this originally was the Americans were going to build one and then the Europeans wanted to build one and then um, the Russians were going to build one and China was going to build one and there was some discussions and basically the European Space Agency, Canada, um, Russia, the United States all got together and, and planned what is still the largest international technical project ever. Um, it's up there with the Panama Canal and uh, those kinds of things um, in terms of the achievement. It's got these massive solar panels from end to end. It's about a football field. So now that's not all space that you can walk around in. Most of this stuff here is just um, a truss work to, to have the solar panels on. It's basically like just empty um, girders and things like that. If we look at the, the top view, Here's the areas you can live in. So here's the Japanese module. I forgot Japan was involved there. Here's the European space module. This section down here is the American space. And then down at the end here is the Russian space. Oh, and look at that. The Salyut shape shows up again in the Zvezda module, which is the main Russian living space. So 
50 years on, the very first space station still sort of lives on, at least in, in concept, as part of the uh, International Space Station, which I think is super cool because, you know, you, you sort of think, oh, technology changes things so quickly. Well, when it has to, yes, but, and obviously the insides of the Salyut space station have become computerized and there's all these, there's all these additions, but the basic form worked so well that they didn't see the need to change it. Of course, on the International Space Station, uh, Canada's participation uh, has been major. Literally, they couldn't build the space station without us because it was Canadarm2, the robot arm, that literally put all the pieces together, the ones that went up by Russian rockets, the ones that went up in the space shuttle. The Canadarm1 would pick it up, hand it to Canadarm2, Canadarm2 would put it in place, and the astronauts would bolt it in, and, and basically that's how you uh, have the, the space station go. Right now, many of the resupply vessels that come up with the fresh food and air and all that kind of stuff uh, are grappled by the Canadarm. They don't actually have uh, a proper enough guidance system to go in and sort of dock to the right spot. So they just fly near the space station, Canadarm 2 grabs them, and then puts them where they need to go. It's a much safer way um, because you really don't want something to crash into your space station. Um, you know, one of these vehicles trying to get into the garage or whatever and they hit the door or they you know hit the house instead not a good thing on the international space station right now this is this is as of today so um there are one two three four five six spacecraft attached there there's um the dragon spacecraft this is spacex's big thing there's the cygnus spacecraft this is a um Un, uh, a robotic freighter that brings up basically uh, supplies. There's two Soyuz spacecraft. Those are the Russian uh, three-person spacecraft to bring the crew up. And then there's two Russian Progress robotic freighters that come up with fuel and air and stuff like that. And actually, one of them uh, was just used to help change the space station's orbit uh, just, a, just a little while ago. As the space station goes around the Earth, it slowly starts to sink down. So before they're done with these, these uh, robotic uh, spacecraft, they use their engines to give the space station just a little boost so that it can stay up again for a little while. Um, and oh, there's the question right there. Uh, Mike just asked, does the space station need to boost itself? Space station doesn't have significant enough engines. I mean, they have a few, but not really for boosting. They tend to use the progress vessels for that. And um, that's, the, that's pretty much how they do that. So every three or six months, basically. And uh, let's see. So that's a, as of today. And as of today, there are 10 people living in space on the International Space Station. 11, if you count me. Um, so there's uh, basically a, a crew that's going to be leaving. Three of them are leaving tomorrow and coming home. Normally, there's a crew of seven. But when they change over, they bring up three fresh astronauts. They stick around for a couple of weeks so that everybody knows what they're doing. And then they, three of them go home. And um, Abby just asked, uh, how do the rockets with people on them safely return to Earth? Well, rockets have to go really, really fast to get up into space. And then when you're in space, you're going around the Earth really, really fast. So the trick about getting home is being able to slow down. So when, you're ro when your spaceship leaves the space station, you go back into the Earth, you, you slow down, and that makes you start falling towards the Earth. And as you fall... You start going through the air that's around the Earth. Now, if you take your hands and rub them together, they start to get warm. That's called friction, right? If you could rub your hands together at the speed of a spacecraft, they would probably burst into flames or something because it, it would get just so hot. So the spacecraft has a heat shield on it, and that heat shield protects it from the friction through the atmosphere, and it helps it slow down. And then once it's slowed down a little bit, it puts out a parachute, which slows it down even more. And then it floats nicely down to the ground. And just before landing, it shoots some rockets out the bottom as well, just to give an extra sort of cushion. And then they come back to Earth. And uh, often they need a little bit of help to get out of their rocket because they've been out, out in space for six months, some of them. And they haven't had gravity for that long. And they've been floating around and not having to worry about um, you know, how much they weigh or anything like that. And then suddenly you're back on Earth in gravity and everything feels really, really heavy. 
the astronauts that I've talked to said that's that's the worst part about space travel is, is coming back and having to get used to gravity again. Because when you're in space, you know, you could be writing something and you could just take your pen and you could just put it and let go of it in the air and it would just float there and then you could go back to get it. So apparently they do that with coffee cups and, and pens when they get back for a couple of weeks. They're like, yeah, I'll just put my pen here. Oops. So it takes a little bit of practice to get back. So, all right. Let's, um, let's uh, move along. Oh, we got a comment here from Lucy. Uh, the heat in spacecraft re-entering is caused by the air in front of it being compressed. Um, yeah, that's a part of it. Um, the, the heat shield um, is usually made of an ablative material. And so as it heats up, it starts to sort of char away and things like that. Um, and so because it's coming in with such force, you get that kind of thing. Oh, more questions about George too. Um, George is around, he is down here. Uh, he may be stalking me, but he didn't he didn't want to come and sit on my lap before the show started and I've learned to not try and force him. So um, We may see him. And we may again, not. just to point out George is Scott's cat. Thank you. Yes For those who are just joining us for the first time his cat Yes, um, we realized after last show we talked about George and how he was sick and how there was all these things going on and we forgot to mention that he was my cat and a couple of people were quite confused anyway okay so we have um the space station um there are other space stations the international space station is still up there china decided to not join the international space station consortium they built their own um interestingly that same kind of shape shows up there it's not exactly the same but it is a similar kind of uh shape and the, and they're their um, uh, Shenzhou spacecraft is not too dissimilar from the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, but they have their own program and they tend to not release a lot of pictures either. They've flown a couple of these Tiangong uh, spacecraft and their next plan is to take the same kind of thing and do like the Mir space station where you have several modules that get stuck together in orbit. So that'll be interesting. There'll be another group of people living off the planet. One of the things that I think is, is kind of neat is that, so in 1998, when the International Space Station started being, um, started having astronauts on it, that was the last time that all the humans in the world were together on Earth. Ever since 1998, there's always been a few humans that are not on the Earth that are up in the International Space Station. And that's just going to increase there'll be more people living in space maybe we'll eventually go to the moon or the mars or something like that and it'll be pretty uh pretty um exciting to see as we expand outwards and become a multi-planetary species of of humans here it may take a long time it may happen quickly if we make discoveries or whatever who knows but it's it's kind of exciting um let's see oh yeah ken was asking about um the iss yeah the uh, the ISS, it's been up since 1998. Some of it is past its warranty. I mean, they've had issues with, uh, they had an air leak, not a dangerous one, but like a, one that they had to track down and figure out what was going on. And they, they have occasional problems. The, they have to bring up new pieces of equipment and stuff like that. Um, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, talk about what, it's, what is going to happen with it it would be a shame to just let it fall into the ocean. And in fact, the Russians have sort of suggested that if that's going to be the plan, they'll just take their part and keep it up there and operate it themselves and uh, sort of disconnect from the space station. We'll have to see um, what the plans are. But um, as long as it's safe and useful, it kind of makes sense to, to keep it going. There's even been some suggestion that you, you could send a giant rocket up there and then just take this thing and push it out towards the moon and put it in orbit around the moon. I think that's maybe a little too difficult, but still some interesting things. Oh, and um, a couple of questions here about food in space. Um, and then Lucy had a comment about uh, tube, uh, tube and a toothpaste kind of thing. Well, in the early days, they didn't want you to have anything that would um, get out. You know, if you've got a bowl of Cheerios in zero gravity, they're going to float all over the place. So everything was in a tube and you would eat it like a milkshake. Like in, um, 
oh, Wally, you know, where they're all getting all of their cupcakes in a cup, that kind of stuff. Well, now they actually realized um, NASA uh, discovered this great stuff. It's called um, sauce. And so if you make a sauce for your food that is thick and sticky enough, the food doesn't float away. So you can actually now have real food in space. And the astronauts actually get to taste their menus before they go up there and pick the things that they like the best. So you can have um, real food. Um, shrimp cocktail is one, one of the things that apparently is quite popular. You can have rice, you can have cake, you can have all sorts of things. So I think it's gotten a little better, but uh, still probably not as nice as being able to go to the uh, all you can eat salad bar or something like that that we have down here. All right, Mike, how are we doing for questions? Anything coming up on social media? Oh, yeah, we, we've got lots of questions. Uh, how are we in terms of your, uh, your timeline of agenda here? Do we uh, do you we're, want to we're, move to some more questions or do you have yeah, some more you want to talk about? Just a one more quick thing. Um, I mean, and, and that's this image here. This, this is from 2001, the movie, which was made back in the 60s. And it was like a, a guess of what space stations would be like in 2001. And here you have this gigantic rotating space station. It rotates so that it makes artificial gravity. And there were basically space liners that would just go up and down every day. And you could just buy a ticket to go into space and people would work in space. That would be their daily commute, would be a rocket up to the space station. Obviously, we're not there yet, um, but this kind of concept is not really that far-fetched. I mean, we could do this now. It would just cost a huge amount of money, and you have to sort of prioritize where you spend your time, I guess. But science fiction has always looked ahead farther than we can maybe reasonably get to. You know, you, you've got the Star Trek universe which sort of gives a very hopeful future for, for humanity as we uh, expand outwards and, and uh, potentially meet other intelligent species and stuff like that. So, I mean, science fiction doesn't always necessarily get it 100% right, but it's amazing how much of the, of the technology has been forecast by science fiction. So it's, it's not too surprising that um, science fiction is sort of uh, undergoing a renaissance right now. Lots of people, you know, seeing that kind of stuff for, for maybe the first time. And uh, it's uh, it's become quite popular. I know that uh, I know that Mike might be a, a slight Star Trek fan. Not, oh. not true. No. No, not, not true. Not true. No, he no, has a tribble. I've never watched an episode of my life. Maybe, yeah, maybe, he, maybe a couple here. And there. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, there's a question here about uh, Hollywood movies. So it turns out that to Hollywood invented artificial gravity because that basically allowed them to ignore completely the fact that in space you should be floating around. And because that's really expensive. I mean, there have been a couple of movies, Apollo 13 um, with Tom Hanks. They, uh, they actually did some of that in the airplane that goes up and does the, the loops that gives you microgravity for 30 seconds or whatever. And so they actually filmed some of that in microgravity essentially to make it as realistic as possible, but it was hugely expensive. Most of them just say, oh yeah, we'll just press this magic button and suddenly the artificial gravity kicks in. It's totally a budget thing. Um, it's kind of too bad. Um, even even in science fiction, you've got all of these... Um, which Star Trek was it, Mike, where they uh, they were in the nebula and they, they went down and then up again to surprise the other guy and that was apparently a, a big deal because he was thinking in two dimensions instead of three. Was that Wrath of Khan? Well, again, I, I'm I'm I've only watched a little bit of Star <laughs> Trek, but yes, that would be Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan. Yeah. Yes. So With I've the, heard, anyway. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so there there are so many things that um, you know the science is not necessarily well thought through in in some of these, and and then on the other hand, there are some that are exceptionally well thought through. So there's uh, there's all that. Um, yeah. So let's uh, let's throw thing over to some questions. If you've got a lot of them there, let's let's get through a f few of them. Okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, maybe try to keep your answers uh, a little bit short here. Cause I don't know that we're going to get through them all. People are fascinated about the space station. Um, uh, an, oh, a really old question here that came in a few minutes ago from, uh, from Spencer on zoom. Uh, he asked, uh, or they asked, sorry, uh, why did Skylab and I guess any other space stations, why do they fall? Well, it turns out that the atmosphere of the earth goes way far than farther than people think. 
it's actually very, very thin up at a few hundred kilometers, but there is atmosphere there. And so as the space station goes around the Earth at 300 kilometers above the surface, there's still some air pushing on it and slightly slowing it down. And so every once in a while, you have to give yourself a little reboost to get back up there. And that was the, um, that was the, the whole point of the, the progress vessels and their, their refueling and all that kind of stuff so that you could sort of boost yourself up again. If you went high enough, you would be able to avoid that. But the problem is it's much harder to go up that high with something big like a space station. You need a much bigger rocket. So the, the compromise is that we'll put it up only a few hundred kilometers, accepting the fact that we're going to have to keep reboosting it. But it just means we can have a better space station. Ultimately, though, when you run out of fuel or if you're not going to send more people there, it's going to just eventually spiral in and it gets to the point where it just re-enters the atmosphere and burns up. So good question. Yep. OK. Uh, Melissa asked, uh, how often does the air need to be replenished on the ISS? Well, the air doesn't need to be replenished. They recycle and refilter it, essentially. Um, and they do have some uh, carbon dioxide scrubbers to take the CO2 out. And they do have oxygen tanks that they they can use to replenish the oxygen in the air, essentially. But that's sort of it's just like an ongoing thing. They don't they don't do it. Um, it's not like they they change all the atmosphere over or anything like that. So it's just part of the the equipment of the space station. And then when the progress vessels come up, they bring oxygen and they bring water and they bring some of those consumables and they automatically sort of refill the tanks. And that happens every three or six months. Okay, uh, sorry, I, I, yep. uh, I'm, I'm madly trying to keep up with questions here. Uh, let's go with uh, Jasmina's question on Facebook. How long can you stay up in space? Well, if you do it properly, you could stay up in space forever. There are, in fact, some satellites that were launched back in the late 50s that are still up there and will be up there for a thousand years just because they're in an orbit that doesn't decay. As a person, though, basically it's all about, you know, how long do you have air and how long do you have food and things like that. So the, the astronauts in the space station, most of them go up for three or six months. There have been a few that have done a year. There was a, a guy on Mirror um, back in the, I guess in 1990, when the Soviet Union collapsed and basically their space program stopped and he was the only guy on Mir and they were like, we're not sure if we can come and get you, so just stay there for a while. And that's basically, you know, he was up for, I think, 700 days or something like that. I think that's still the record. Good question. Yeah, a very good question. Uh, boy, yeah, we're not going to have time for all these questions, so I do apologize. Um, but let's um, just try to keep it uh, sort of keeping with the ISS theme. Uh, what are the living quarters on the International Space Station like when people are off duty? Well, there's a there's a crew um, quarters where you have your own private room and your room is basically a sleeping bag stapled to the wall with a little curtain that keeps you private. And then, um, but there's also, uh, there's a gym where you've got like a bicycle to work out on and you've got, uh, um, they, they tend to all eat dinner at the same time because that way you can trade food with people. And so there is a, a little galley with a kitchen and a, a couple of places with hot and cold water to heat up your various foods, basically the equivalent of the microwave and stuff like that. Um, but not a lot of relaxation time um, or uh, relaxation space. Other than, I guess there's the one spot, the, the, the cupola, which basically has windows in all directions. Apparently that's a popular place for people to get away and just watch the earth. Good one. Um, okay, and maybe I'll just wrap things up because like I said, we're not going to have time yeah. for everybody's questions here. But uh, a lot of people just sort of asking about life on the ISS. Uh, and I know, I think it was Terry on Facebook was asking for a recommendation of a, of a book that sort of describes the ISS exactly how, how you were describing it earlier. And mm. maybe I'll just throw a plug out there for uh, Colonel Chris Hadfield's book, uh, You Are Here, uh, which details a lot of his experiences uh, when he was on board the ISS and uh, was the commander of the ISS for a period of time. Uh, I mean, he is, of course, a, an amazing storyteller and uh, 
uh, his his tales of of life on the ISS, um, as well as a lot of his photos too, are just incredible. Uh, so if if I were to recommend a book about that, I would go with that. Totally and agree. One last quick comment uh, before I. Th- throw things back to you scott uh jeffrey on uh, on zoom uh was trying to point out that uh, he thought that it was a skylab that fell due to john connor and i love the terminator <laughs> reference but uh that was actually skynet um but uh, i i appreciate the uh the uh, the effort on that one i, I love i love when Nicely sci-fi done. references get thrown in here yeah well played, well played. Now, um, we will be talking about how to see the International Space Station in the sky uh, closer to the date when that can happen. Because of the orbit change, that actually won't be happening till around April 30th, where we'll get some morning passes, and then evening passes are a while off. But there is this great website called Heavens Above, heavensabove.com. You can uh, click on this section to change your... Um, to change your observing location and set it for Winnipeg or wherever you are. And then you can click on the International Space Station and it basically gives you a table of all of the sightings. Here, I'll just click forward here. There's all of the sightings that will be visible for me here in Winnipeg. And each one of these comes along with a star map. Oh, it gives us a little ad there telling me exactly what constellations, exactly what time this is going to happen. So I can go out and I know that the space station will be coming over at that time so we'll work over this uh, in a future episode but if you do want to get prepared you can check out heavensabove.com thank you very much for joining us on this uh, particularly long episode of uh, dome at home but it was great to get so many comments and questions and things like that we will of course be um, back next week and uh, next week we will be looking at uh, a few different topics as well Um, we'll be back with constellation of the month Uh, or connect the dots and i promise that i will get the cool space stuff theme fixed for next week so thanks again for joining us and we will see you all next week i hope you get clear skies and i hope uh, we don't get any more snow rain is fine we need rain but uh, it would be nice to get rid of the snow i'm done with winter thanks again have a great evening